All right, let's roll. Okay, as always, here is our social media links. Everything is at Think Fiveable. Uh, we have a TikTok now, so feel free to check that out. Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Today in the stream, we are going to be going over units five, six, and seven. That includes momentum, simple harmonic motion, and then torque and rotational motion. All right. Um, unlike what previous streams have been, this is just going to be an overview of the topics that are fair game on your exam. Um, it's going to be not, it's all content, no problem solving. So all of your problem solving um, practice uh, is the one o'clock stream on Wednesdays. Um, next week at one is with Peter. He's going to be going over open questions. Um, so open Q&A. So if you have any questions that haven't been covered, feel free to bring those there. Um, and likewise, next Wednesday at seven uh, will be open Q&A with me also. So if you have questions that you want to go over, if there's a topic you're still confused about, um, feel free to post in the chat and I can prep something um, to make sure that we have that to go, ready to go. Okay. So to start unit five, we have momentum. The topics included in the momentum unit are momentum and impulse, uh, representations of changes in momentum, open and closed systems when we're talking about momentum, and then conservation of linear momentum. So for momentum and impulse, um, one of the big things to take away is that the change in momentum of an object is a vector. And the change in momentum is the direction of the net force exerted on the object. So from P equals MV, um, your change in momentum, your delta P, your P final minus P initial, is going to be in the direction of the thing that's changing your momentum, which makes sense, right? So just remember that momentum is a vector and the outside force that is acting on your thing to change the momentum is in the same direction as the change in momentum. All right. Next big idea is that the change in momentum of an object occurs over some time interval. So this is what we usually refer to as the impulse. Your impulse is your change in momentum, your delta P, which is equal to F delta T. So if we have a force exerted over some period of time, that's gonna change your momentum. And there's two ways that you can adjust this equation uh, which we're going to have examples of here in a minute. Um, you can increase or decrease your force or an increase or decrease the amount of time that that force is applied to get the same effects. All right. So the force that one object exerts on a second object changes the momentum of that object in the absence of other forces on the object. So if I push on the box, I'm going to change the momentum of the box, is basically what that's saying. All right. OK. And the change of momentum of that object depends on the impulse. So that was our F delta T, which is the product of the average force and the time interval during which the interaction occurred. So if you reduce the average impact force or extend the time of collision, you can change that amount of momentum change. Blah. Change the amount of impulse, which is your change of momentum. Excuse me. Okay. So one of the biggest ways that this is seen in practice or in real life I like using this example. This is basically how crash test dummies work too. So what I want you all to think about is how come the egg doesn't break in the second GIF? GIF, GIF, GIF. I don't want to start a war today. Feel free to throw something in the chat box. Let me know what you think. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So we're still, we have the same change in momentum. We're taking our egg from pitching it to stop. So our change in momentum is the same, but the amount of time that that force is applied is a lot longer in the second frame. So because you have that crumple zone, if you will, it's extending the time that you're in contact with the wall, which is therefore reducing the average force that's on the egg. So it doesn't break. And this is exactly how like your cars work and stuff. So have you, if you've ever like had the unfortunate <laughs> experience of crashing a car, uh, you know how it gets all smushed up in the front and they have the crumple zones? That's why they have those. Like your car is designed to get totaled to save your life. Um, so when you crash into a wall and your car goes smush, 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 it does that on purpose to extend the time of contact so that the force of you slamming into the wall, breaking your neck is a lot less than if it was just a hard collision. I should send you a picture of my car. I crashed my car, well, I got crashed into in January and my car is a mess. Oh, that was a good idea, I should have put that in there. All right, okay. So interactions with other objects or systems can change the total linear momentum of a system, which makes sense, right? Like if you're interacting with a system, you're probably putting some kind of force on it. So you're, therefore you're changing the momentum. Okay. So the change in linear momentum for a constant mass system is the product of the mass of the system and the change in velocity of the center of mass. So P equals MV. And the units for momentum are the same as the units for the area under a curve of a force versus time graph. So just like in unit one with our kinematics, you can go from a velocity time graph to displacement by taking the area under the curve. You can get your impulse by taking the area under the curve of a force time graph. So in this uh, GIF, GIF that we're seeing right now, where we're bouncing the ball, it's recording the amount of force on the ball as time goes by. And so the area under that curve is the impulse. And so you can use that to get your average force on the ball. All right. Okay, so the change in linear momentum and force are both vectors in the same direction. So this was so important, they put it in their list of things to know twice. So I put it in here twice. All right, so then when we start talking about open and closed systems with regards to momentum, certain quantities are conserved in the sense that changes of those quantities in a given system are always equal to the transfer of that quantity to or from the system by all possible interactions with other systems. So just like how we have conservation of energy, the amount of energy that you start with is the amount of energy that you end with. And if it's in an open system, you can give energy or you can take energy out, but the total is still the same. It's the same way with momentum. So you can put momentum in by putting a force, an external force, or you can take momentum out by having an external force. And if it's a closed system, then the total momentum is gonna be constant. So for all systems under all circumstances, energy, charge, linear momentum, and angular momentum are always conserved. So whatever you start with is whatever you end with for those what, four things. And that's how we solve 90% of our physics problems. And for an isolated or a closed system, conserved quantities are constant. And you can apply this to any conservation of energy, conservation of charge, conservation of momentum, angular momentum. How you define your system depends on how you treat the total quantity. All right, an open system is one that exchanges any conserved quantity with its surroundings. So like we said earlier, 
you can put energy in, you can take energy out, but the total is the same. Or you can apply a force to change the momentum, but the total is the same. Okay. And I think I accidentally hit the back button. My bad. All right. So the linear momentum of a system is conserved. And that's where we get into the conservation of linear momentum. All right, so there's two types of collisions that we end up seeing in physics one. Uh, we have our elastic collisions. So in an elastic collision, your kinetic energy is the same before and after. There's no energy transfer. So your elastic collision is when you have your two objects come together and they bounce off of each other. Right. And again, in the closed system, the linear momentum is constant throughout the collision. So for our elastic collision, both the momentum and the kinetic energy are the same before and after. So in our nice elastic collision, all of the momentum from the big blob is getting transferred to the small one. All right, and in an inelastic collision, that's when your two things come together and stick. Your kinetic energy is not the same before and after the collision. In most cases, um, that energy gets transferred internally. We usually attribute it to heat transfer. Um, so like if your cars are crashing into each other and they're getting smushed up, um, you're adding energy to the cars and the like the structure of the cars and crumpling them and so they feel warm when you touch them so a lot of that kinetic energy is being transferred into thermal energy when those crash together and then they're sticking together and then they continue on their way all right so again in a closed system the kinetic energy of an inelastic collision is different from the kinetic energy before the collision The velocity of the center of mass of the system cannot be changed by an interaction within the system. So this is another conceptual point for collisions. Um, the center of mass of the two things colliding is always going to be going the same velocity. There's no way to change that without some external interaction. So if your system con consists of the two objects, when they come and smash together, their center of mass is going to stay in the same place and it's going to go at the same velocity. So your center of mass depends on the mass and the position of the objects that are in your system. Uh, is that the same for acceleration? Uh, so when we're look yeah, so when we're looking at um, collisions in particular, we're always looking at those as if they're a closed system, so there's no external forces to give acceleration to the collision. Um, if we are looking at, say, hang on, adding this to the question thing. Um, if we're looking at this as, say, a an open system um, where you have that external force going in on it, that does apply to the center of mass as well. Um, so that was back in, in unit two. So whenever you have a net force on a system of objects, um, it's the center of mass that's going to accelerate. Yeah. Okay. Da, 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 da. Okay. Yep. So anything that you do to a system of objects is going to affect the center of mass. So if there's no external thing going in, which in a closed system, there's not, your acceleration is gonna stay zero for the whole system. Okay, so when objects in a system collide, the velocity of the center of mass of the system will not change unless an external force is exerted on the system. All right, so that means there's no acceleration unless there's an external force. Okay. 
So in physics one, you need to know, or in physics one is the idea that if there's a heavier mass and a lighter mass, the center of mass is closest to the heavy object. Um, you don't need to know how to actually calculate the center of mass. You just need to have a like a qualitative understanding of how that works. So if you have two objects that are equal mass, their center of mass is going to be right in between them. And if you have a center of mass or two objects where one is much bigger, your center of mass is going to be closer to the heavier one. So you can think of it as like, I'm outing myself as a nerd right now. Uh, so <laughs> Have you, if you've ever had like a sword, either real or fake made out of foam, and you've tried to balance it, the majority of the mass is in the handle, right? So when you're trying to balance it on your hand, your hand is gonna be a lot closer to the handle. So it's gonna be closer to the majority of the mass so that you can balance it. Think of it kind of like as a teeter-totter almost. All right. But again, you don't need to know how to actually calculate it. That's in physics too. Um, you just need to know conceptually how that works. All right. So again, uh, you're expected to be able to locate the center of mass of highly symmetric distributions. So if you have a uniform rod, the center of mass is in the middle. Um, or a cube, the center of mass is in the middle. Um, or two spheres of equal mass. Again, the center of mass is in the middle, uh, but you don't need to know how to actually physically calculate that. All right, that is the end of unit five. Any questions before we roll on to unit six? Momentum and all of its fun goodness. Oh, also uh, 2D collisions are fair game. Um, you won't need to know how to solve the system of equations that comes out of it, but you do need to know how to set them up if you get one of those. Um, so make sure your vector addition skills are good. Uh, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna grab one of those for next week so we can go over one of those. So if you wanna see a 2D collision for a free response question, we'll do that next week at seven. Moving on to unit six. Okay, so unit six is simple harmonic motion. And the two, two topics that are included in that are the period of simple harmonic oscillators and the energy of a simple harmonic oscillator. So first up, restoring forces are what cause oscillatory motion and therefore simple harmonic motion. Um, so when you have a linear restoring force exerted on an object displaced from an equilibrium position, that object will undergo a special type of motion called simple harmonic motion. So simple harmonic motion is the sinusoidal kind of motion that we've seen um, with our springs. Our mass on a spring is one of the common examples, and a pendulum at small angles is the other example that we use in physics one. So the emphasis here is that it has to be a linear restoring force. So again, examples include a gravitational force exerted by Earth on a simple pendulum so at small angles, is the important part there, and a mass spring oscillator. So for a mass spring oscillator, uh, for a spring that exerts a linear restoring force, which is our negative kx, is our spring restoring force. Uh, the period of the mass spring oscillator increases with mass and decreases with spring stiffness. So the period of a spring of a mass on a spring is two pi square root m over k. So you just need to remember the relationship that if you put more mass on the spring, it's gonna take longer for it to go back and forth, which kind of makes sense, right? Like you have more mass on the spring, it's heavier, it's harder to get it moving, so it's gonna bounce back and forth a lot slower. And then for your spring, if you increase your spring constant, you make it springier, more spritchy, uh, it's gonna be a lot more like bouncy, I guess. It's, I don't know how to I don't know how to put that into words. <laughs> 
All right, so if you if your spring is stiffer, you're gonna decrease the period. It's gonna bounce a lot faster because it's more springy. There we go. The more springy it is, the faster it oscillates. All right, so then we have this nice animation over here on the right. Um, your restoring force is always trying to pull it back to the equilibrium position. So it either does that by pulling it back in or pushing it back out. All right. Likewise, for a simple pendulum, the period increases with the length of the pendulum and decreases with the magnitude of the gravitational field. So it's the 2 pi square root of L over G, where L is the length of the string or the stick, depending on what kind of pendulum it is, and G is the acceleration due to gravity. So this applies both on Earth, where G is 9.81, or you can calculate G for the moon, Mars, other planets, what have you. Um, this will still be the, the period equation. Um, so something to note here, uh, the force from gravity isn't technically linear, but for the pendulum at small angles and small displacements, um, if you do, I don't know how far y'all are in math, but if you do a Taylor expansion <laughs> of the gravitational force um, at small angles, it's approximately linear, which is why pendulums at small angles um, observe like exhibit simple harmonic motion if you start displacing them a lot further they start going into um like a what am i trying to say not simple harmonic motion you end up getting like a quadratic dependence um on the period uh based on length and then if you get like super big like it goes it goes wild so it's only simple harmonic motion at small angles is what you need to take away from that all right. Okay. So one of the other conceptual points that they really like to exploit on these AP exams um, is that the mass on the end of the string doesn't affect the period at all. So you can have a light mass, you can have a heavy mass, you can have an entire planet on the end. Um, the only thing that matters is the length of the string. So the shorter the length, the faster it oscillates. Okay. So the minima, the maxima, and the zeros of the position, velocity, and acceleration are interesting features about simple harmonic motion. Um, and you should be able to calculate the force and acceleration for any given displacement for an object oscillating on a spring. So your force is given by F equals minus KX. Um, so from that, you can get the acceleration at any point. Um, yeah, that covers it. Okay. <laughs> so you know the force to based on how far displaced you are from equilibrium. So you can get your acceleration. Your acceleration is always going to be in the direction of your force. Remember that. So your acceleration is always going to be trying to pull you back to equilibrium. Okay. Some graphs that you may end up seeing um, for our simple harmonic oscillators um, is that for your position, velocity, acceleration graphs, things of note is that your velocity is zero at the turnaround points. So when your spring is fully extended and you're starting to come back up, uh, velocity is zero at the bottom and at the top of those and the velocity is highest when you're passing through equilibrium. Likewise, um, your acceleration is the maximum at the bottom and the top of the oscillation because you're the further away it is, the higher your acceleration is and the higher your force is because that's like trying to pull you back, right? All right. So just like with every other form of energy, the energy of a simple harmonic oscillator is conserved. And your potential energy exists within the system if objects within that system interact with conservative forces. So 
a reminder about what a conservative force is. The work done by a conservative force is independent of the path taken. So it doesn't matter how you get there, the work done is still the same. Um, the work description is used for forces external to the system. So if you're using like F equals MA to look at the motion of an object, um, you're using the work um, description. But when we're looking at closed systems, which we do when we're talking about conservation of energy um, or the work energy theorem, sorry, um, is when we start using potential energy. So potential energy is what we use when the, um, the forces are internal interactions between parts of the system. So like when we use, like when we look at a pendulum, you can either treat the pendulum as its individual object and the force of gravity is acting upon it so gravity is doing work or you can treat the pendulum and the earth as a system and do gravitational potential energy and that gets converted into kinetic energy so the way that you treat the problem depends on how you define your system so make sure that you always do that first all righty so when we're talking about energy of our simple harmonic oscillators the changes in the internal structure can result in changes of potential energy. So when we're looking at our spring, when we stretch our spring out or we smush our spring down, we give it, what's the word? Elastic potential energy, there we go. Our elastic potential energy is given by one half kx squared, where k is the spring constant and x is the displacement from equilibrium. And our change in gravitational potential energy is mg change in position, vertical position. All right. So when we look at, at the internal energy of a system, that includes the kinetic energy of the objects in the system and the potential energy of the configuration of the objects that make up that system. So in the system of our block on a spring, the total energy is going to stay the same. Our elastic potential energy is going to oscillate back and forth as you stretch and compress the spring. And our kinetic energy is going to compensate to give a total energy that's the same. So conservation of energy is definitely the, uh, the most straightforward way to solve oscillator problems, in my opinion. But you could, again, you can do the force work like the F equals minus KX and calculate acceleration and change of velocity from there, you will get the same answer. It's just one way is definitely easier than the other as far as like steps. All right. So again, since energy is constant in a closed system, your changes in your potential energy result in changes to your kinetic energy so that the total is constant. Okay, that is the end of unit six, simple harmonic oscillators. Any questions about those before we roll on to unit seven? Let me give you like another 20 seconds in case you're typing. I don't know how fast y'all type. How's it going, y'all? You good? Hanging in there. This is a lot of a lot of information in your face. I apologize. Okie dokie. All right, unit seven. So unit seven is our torque and rotational motion. This should hopefully be the freshest in your brain um, as it is the most recent unit and last unit that's gonna be covered on your exam. Unfortunately, circuits got cut, which hurts my soul because it's my favorite subject. All right, anyway, so unit seven includes rotational kinematics, torque and angular acceleration, angular momentum and torque, and then conservation of angular momentum. So first things first, 
your displacement, velocity, and acceleration from unit one are all vector quantities. And remember that displacement is a change in position. Velocity is the rate of change of position with time. And acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with time. So for every linear quantity that we have, there is an angular equivalent. So your linear acceleration A, there's angular acceleration alpha. And you can get back and forth between the two by using the relationship alpha equals A over R. So your angular acceleration is your linear acceleration divided by the radius of the circle that you're traveling in. Velocity V has an equivalent angular velocity omega. And again, you can get from omega to V and vice versa by omega equals V over R. And lastly, your position X is equivalent to your angular position theta is how we measure angles. And theta is the arc length S, so the distance around the edge of the circle divided by R. All right. So as with all your linear quantities, um, changes in any of these, uh, what you need to calculate arc length. That is a probability. Um, I I, I'm not totally sure if you're going to be expected to calculate arc length or not. Um, if you would, it would be the minimally easiest version of like you traveled 30 degrees around a circle with a radius of 10. How far did you go? Um, that would be the extent of it. Um, or like you have a wheel that traveled uh, like three rotations. If the radius of the wheel is 10, how far did you go? Um, that is another example of where you would see arc length. Um, trying to think of where else you'd see that. Yeah, that's the only, that's the only thing I can think of that they would have you calculate arc length. Um, is for the example of like you have a car tire and your car tires make X amount of rotations. Um, what distance was that? That's the, yeah. Yep, that's it. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. So changes in each property are expressed by subtracting final minus initial. Um, just like with your linear quantities, if you want the change in position, it's final minus initial. If you have your change in angle, it's final minus initial. Um, everything you ever learned about kinematics in unit one still applies in unit seven. There's just different letters. So to emphasize that, here's our kinematic equations. Um, so velocity equals V naught plus AT has an identical angular counterpart, omega equals omega naught plus alpha T. For our X equals X plus, or X naught plus V naught T plus one half AT squared, you have theta equals theta naught plus omega naught T plus one half alpha T squared. And lastly, V final squared equals V initial squared plus 2A delta X. Omega final squared equals omega initial squared plus 2 alpha delta theta. So every kinematic equation that you've ever used, there is an identical equation for rotational kinematics. Um, so that's one of the things that really tripped me up when I was learning about rotational motion was that never quite clicked for me. It was just like, wait. <laughs> This is exactly the same thing, except it's in a circle instead of straight. So I like to point that out. <laughs> okay. So your kinematic equations, as a reminder, only apply to constant acceleration situations. That's the same for linear and also angular. Um, in physics one, you are highly unlikely to see a time dependent acceleration situation unless it's just like, look at the graph um, and calculate your velocity, position, etc. from your position time graphs.
Um, okay. So that's our rotational kinematics. Blam. Next topic was torque and angular acceleration. So just like a force exerted on an object can cause an acceleration of that object, um, a force exerted on an object can also cause a torque on that object. So torque is like a rotationaliness. It's how I like to think about it. Um, so your torque, tau, is equal to the perpendicular component of R times F. Um, so only the force component perpendicular to the line connecting the axis of rotation and the point of the application of the force results in a torque about that axis. And so that's what we call the lever arm. That's that perpendicular distance from the center, your axis of rotation, to where that force is being applied. All right, so the magnitude of the torque is the length of the lever arm multiplied by the magnitude of the force perpendicular to it. And just like in uh, Newton's second law, the sum of the forces in a balanced system is equal to zero. The sum of the torques in a balanced system is equal to zero here as well. Okay. So, as a question to y'all, to fire up your brain a little bit, when is the torque equal to zero? Um, when there's no angular acceleration. Okay. So if there's no angular acceleration, uh, that means that our net torque is equal to zero. Yeah. Um, what about like an individual, an individual torque? Like in this situation with the wrench and the force, where do I have to push on that to get my torque to be zero? At the pivot. Not sure, not sure what I know what you mean by the pivot. At the center when r equals zero, yep, okay. Yep, so that works. So you can just push it like right on the center. You're not gonna have a torque. Um, where else? Where else can I push so that I won't have any torque? Or how else can I push? Parallel to the radius, right, exactly. So if my rent, my wrench is coming out this way and I just push straight on it, so it's like push this way, that's not gonna cause a rotation at all. It's not gonna cause a torque, exactly. All right, so along that line, why are long wrenches more effective? So have y'all ever seen that like, when you need to change your tire, Go find like a big stick to get the bolts off if you can't get it yourself. Why does that work? If what I said just made any sense. Why are long wrenches more effective? We're gonna chill here. So at least one of you answers my question. There's five of you. Somebody can answer my question. Exactly. Yep, so because torque depends on the radius and the amount of force. So the bigger your lever arm, so the longer your wrench, the more torque is going to be applied by the same amount of force. So the more turniness. Sweet. Okay. So 
The presence of a net torque along any axis will cause that rigid system to change its rotational motion or an object to change its rotational motion about that, ob about that axis. So this is basically just Newton's second law, but for rotation. So just like the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration, the sum of the torques is equal to your moment of inertia, I, times the angular acceleration. So again, this is where I like to point out that all of the equations from units one and two that you've been using are exactly the same, but all of your a's or alphas, all of your v's or omegas, all of your x's or thetas, all of your m's or i's, and all of your f's or tau's. They're all the same. So if you know how to solve a problem in straight land, you know how to solve a problem in spinny land. All right. So the net torque on a balanced system is zero, just like when the net force on a balanced system is zero. If your net force is zero, there's no acceleration. If your net torque is zero, there's no angular acceleration. So your rotational inertia, I, I like to think of it as rotational mass. So it's like how much oomph it takes to get it spinning. So just like your regular mass, your inertial mass is pushing, is like how much effort it takes to get it to move. Your rotational inertia is how much effort it takes to get it to spin. All right. And from that, a net torque exerted on the system by other objects or systems will cause the angular momentum of that system to change. So just like we said at the beginning of this stream, if you have an external force coming in and messing around with your system, it's going to change the linear momentum. If you have an external torque coming into your system, it's going to change your angular momentum. OK. And just like in unit five, we had delta P equals F delta T, we have delta L equals tau delta T. So again, they're all the same equations, just with the rotational letters. So your change in angular momentum, so angular momentum is a capital L. It is a vector, just like regular momentum, is equal to the torque, which is a vector, times the change in time. All right. So again, here's the rotational version, here's the linear version. So things that you'll need to be able to do with this, you need to be able to predict the behavior of a rotational collision situation. Just like you would predict the behavior of a linear collision situation um, by using the analogy between impulse and the change of linear momentum. And angular impulse and change of angular momentum. Okay. So... Just like how linear momentum, P equals MV, L equals I omega. So your angular momentum is equal to the moment of inertia times your angular velocity. All right. And to emphasize, you do not need to know the equation of an object's rotational inertia. All of that will be provided to you on the exam. Um, but you should have a qualitative sense of what factors affect the rotational inertia. Um, so, for example, why a hoop has more rotational inertia than a puck of the same mass and radius. So some of the common shapes that you'll see are these. So we have our solid cylinder or a disc where the axis of rotation is right down the middle. Uh, your inertia is one half mr squared. A hoop about the symmetry axis is mr squared. A solid sphere is two fifths mr squared. A rod rotating about the center is one twelfth ml squared, where l is the length of the entire rod. Uh, a rod about the end is one third ml squared. A sh spherical shell, so all of the mass is concentrated to the outside is two-thirds mr squared. 
So real quick, I want you to compare that to the one above it with the solid sphere. Your thin spherical shell has a larger moment of inertia because all of the mass is further away from the axis. And similarly, uh, with our hoop versus our solid cylinder, when all of our mass is concentrated towards the outside, the rotational inertia is larger. So that's what it means by uh, have a qualitative sense of what factors affect the rotational inertia. Um, so obviously your mass and the radius of the object, but also the more mass is distributed around the outside, the greater your inertia is going to be because it's further away from the center. So it's going to be harder to move it around. Okay. Um, you're not going to need to know the parallel axis theorem. I don't know if your teacher has gone over that with you at all. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but you're not going to need to know it. So if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Okay. So my favorite example showing uh, angular momentum. Hang on, where'd it go? Play. So if we start off with our mass extended, we spin really slow because we have higher moment of inertia. But as we suck our limbs in, we spin a lot faster because we're reducing our moment of inertia and therefore our angular velocity is going to compensate to conserve our angular momentum. Okay. Alrighty. So question time for y'all. We have two identical cars racing side by side on a circular track. Which one has the greater angular momentum? Two cars are racing side by side. Feel free to throw your answer into the chat. We'll give you 22 more seconds. And then we'll, then we'll cruise along. outside because it has to go more distance to stay at the same speed. Okay. Like the same angular speed? Is that what you mean? Or the same linear speed? Okay. Yeah, so to stay even with the other car, it's going to have to, like you said, it's going to have to go more distance to stay even with it. So that means it's going to have the same angular speed in order to keep up with it. So if you have a greater angular speed, that means you're going to have a greater angular momentum. You can also look at it as... Um, from an inertia, a rotational inertia perspective. So you're further away from the axis of rotation, you're further away from the center of the circle. So therefore you have a greater inertia. So if you're going the same angular speed, then you're gonna have a higher angular momentum. So those are both very, those are both valid ways to look at it. Yep. Cool. Okay. Uh, similarly, the angular momentum of a point object 
So if we're talking about our car, um, is the linear momentum NV times the distance from the point of axis to the rotation. So like you just said, with our car example, it has to go more distance to stay the same speed, which means its linear speed, its linear momentum is greater because it's going faster linearly, not angularly. So its angular momentum is going to be bigger. Okay. So we can get this from our L equals I omega equation as well. So the moment of inertia for a point is just mr squared, where m is the mass and r is how far away from the center it is. Um, our angular velocity is regular velocity over r. So from L equals I omega, we have mr squared times v over r gives us mvr. So if you forget um, the angular momentum of a point object, you can always calculate it from L equals I omega as well. Okay, and just like with linear momentum, angular momentum of a system is conserved. So in an isolated system, the amount of inertia of a rotating object is cut in half. What happens to the angular velocity of the object? Even though you don't have multiple choice questions on your exam, these are a AP test favorites. If you change one variable, what happens to the other? Alrighty. So angular momentum is conserved. Remember that. In an isolated system. So if it's an isolated system, it means our angular momentum is constant. So if I goes down by a factor of two, omega has to go up by a factor of two in order to compensate. So from L equals I omega, omega is gonna be doubled. Okay. So the angular momentum of a system with respect to an axis of rotation is the sum of the angular momenta with respect to that axis of the objects that make up the system. So that's a really long winded way of saying that if you have more than one object going around in a circle, the total angular momentum, you just add them together. Okay, or in equation form, Say we have a bunch of points. So our inertia is just the sum of their individual inertias. And our angular momentums is just the sum of their individual angular momentums. So now this is going to be the same for extended objects as well. So for example, and this is going to be our last slide, so I'm not going to give you the answer if you want to test it. Uh, if we have a blob of clay of mass m dropped on top of a rotating disk's edge of mass 2m spinning at a speed of omega naught, what will the resulting rotational speed omega be? All right. Doo, doo, doo. So we're going to hang out. Thanks for joining. We're gonna hang out until 7.59 before I tell you what the answer is, if you wanna work it out. Uh, thanks for thanks for hanging in, sorry it was really dense. Um, next week at one is open Q&A with Peter, and, or one o'clock Eastern time, yeah, should specify. Uh, and next week at seven Eastern time with me is open Q&A. So far the only thing we have planned is a 2D collision. Um, if there's anything else you want to go over, feel free to put that in the chat box and we can definitely go over that. Uh, hopefully I'll see you next week. If not, good luck on your exam. Kick its butt.
Hopefully it's not too terrible of an experience. At least you luck out. You only have free response this year, right? That's a plus. But yeah, thanks for coming. Now we're going to give you three more minutes. And if you get the answer, feel free to throw it in the chat box. Here, have a bonus cat. With her demon eyes. Can you see her? Meow. Yeah. But the plus side of the seven o'clock streams is that there are cats. <laughs> All right, two more minutes before we get the answer. Okay, that's all right. We'll go over it. Do I have my whiteboard thingy here? Got one over four. Okay. All right. Let me get my. I don't. All right. We're going to open up a whiteboard so I can go over it. And my stylus is not here. I apologize. So I'm going to be writing with my mouse. And I apologize in advance if it's terrible. Okay. Okay. Pardon my giant face. My board. And make it big. Okay. So, where's our question? There's our question. So, we have a blob of clay. Spinning of mass M. So, here's our little blob M. Yikes, this is gonna be bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's dropped on top of a rotating disc edge of mass 2m. So we have our disc. This is gonna be the side view. Two. Oh my goodness. M. Okay. Okay. Spinning at a speed of. Oh my god, not. <laughs> what will the resulting rotational speed omega be? Okay. So we know that our angular momentum that we start with has to be equal to the angular momentum that we end with. That's an F final. Okay. Okay. And we know that angular momentum can be written as L equals I omega, right? Okay. 
Okay. So when we start, initially, our Li is just the disk. So the moment of inertia of a disk is one half. The mass of the disk, which in this case is 2m, uh, r squared. This is the worst whiteboard writing I've ever done. I'm so sorry. Wait. Uh, so that's the moment of inertia, 1 half m r squared. But the mass is 2 big m, according to the problem, and times omega which is omega naught. Okay. So at the end, we have two objects stuck together. So remember, if we have two objects, their angular momentum is the sum. So... We have our, yikes, that's a half. Okay, so we have our disk, so one half, two m, r squared, and its final speed, omega, plus the blob, which the i of a blob is m r squared. Now in this case, the blob is actually a mass of M. And it's at the edge, so R is R squared. And it's going at omega. Okay. So if I go through and cancel off all these nice things, that too cancels with that too. That too cancels with that too. So our initial is M r squared omega naught and our final is m r squared omega plus m r squared omega so i'm just going to stick a two on there okay and so from conservation of angular momentum my initial momentum, my mr squared omega naught, has to be equal to my final momentum, which is my 2 mr squared omega. So my m cancels, my r squared cancels, and we're left with omega naught is equal to 2 omega which if we rearrange, omega is equal to one half omega naught. Cool, cool. So it likes to one of the, the tricky tricky parts about this question is that they gave you the mass with an m in it. So when you're like writing down your angular momentum, you're just like, oh, it's just m r squared. And like, oh, wait, no, like m is not m. M is 2m for the disk anyway. Cool, cool. All right, any questions about that before we roll out? If not, have a lovely day, evening. I guess it's night now. Yeah. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Hopefully I'll see you next week. Uh, if you have any topics you want to go over, feel free to put them in chat right now. And yeah. See you next week for a 2D collision at the minimum. And then whatever else you have to ask.